In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson talks about the role of hypothalamus in our lives and how IQ and life success are related. Freud hypothesized the existence of the id. Now, there is no id in your brain, but it, it doesn't really matter because the id, the idea of the id is a functional category. It's like a tool. But there are lots of id-like structures in your brain. You know, and uh, one of them in particular is the hypothalamus and that thing, like... Human beings like to think that their really impressive cortical cap is the thing that's, you know, in charge of things. But your hypothalamus, which is this little tiny thing that sits at the top of your spinal cord, man, that's what's running you. And let, you know, as long as you're not hungry or not angry or not chasing after sexual excitement and not gambling and not addicted, so as long as you're completely well-fed and warm and comfortable, then you can think and you're more or less in control. But as soon as any of those things go astray, it's subcortical all the way. You know, and you can see this, for example, in conditions like anorexia, you know, because anorexia, you can think of anorexia as a war between the cortex and the hypothalamus. And I'll tell you, man, the only time the cortex wins is when the anorexic dies. Because other than that, it's the hypothalamus that wins all the time, which is why anorexics cannot stop themselves from binging. You know, so they'll, they'll cut their body weight down to, say, 75% of what it should be. And that's hard. Like, you really, it's not easy to starve yourself like that. But they'll still binge like mad, you know, and eat a whole gallon of ice cream and two bags of bread. And they can't stop themselves. And that's because your hypothalamus would, would rather you didn't starve to death. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not on top of the game, or maybe if you've been hurt recently, and so your resources or your, your what would you say, your the negative emotion has been interfering with your cognitive capacity, the hypothalamus will come up and grab you and say, man, you're hungry and it's off to the fridge with you. You know, so <laughs> two in the morning, you're going to be eating everything in there in a kind of a daze and you'll snap out of that and think, wow, what the hell was that? It was like, well, that's the id, folks. And it's no trivial thing and it's a good thing too because if it didn't tell you what to do all the time, like think about how foolish you are. If you had to breathe voluntarily, how, how many days do you think it, you'd go through? Eh? It's like, you'd wake up one day, and an hour later you'd forget to breathe, and then you'd be dead. <laughs> so, like, your, your, your brain doesn't let you do anything important. It takes care of all that in the background, you know, because you're just not that smart. I mean, you don't know how to digest things, for example. You actually don't know how you walk, even though you can do it. So, there are... Various, fundamental subsystems, some of them that aren't even conscious, weirdly enough, even though they're neurological. They're doing all the heavy lifting, and like your cortex is along there, it's along for the ride in some sense, and it sort of thinks it's in control, but yeah, no, not really. Psych psychometrics, very unpopular field of psychology, even among psychologists, and the reason for that is that psychometricians, I guess, have actually discovered things, and people hate what they've discovered. So, and no wonder. So, for example, it was people who do psychometrics. Engineers, actually, who, in, who entered psychology, who discovered intelligence. Technical psychometric intelligence. IQ. And people will tell you, there's lots of kinds of intelligence. It's like, no, there aren't. That's wrong. And it's wrong in this way. The statistics that psychologists use were invented by the people who discovered IQ. And that means every single thing that a psychologist has ever claimed that's been verified in some way using some statistical process has been verified, verified the same way that IQ was verified. And so you don't get to say, well, the IQ stuff's invalid without saying all of psychology and a lot of other fields is invalid too because it's the same methods of proof. And it's even worse than that because like the relationship between IQ and life success is way stronger than the relationship between almost any other psychological phenomena and almost anything else. So, for example, for you guys, even though, you know, you're, you're all far above average in intelligence because otherwise you wouldn't be here, like at least 85th percentile. And that's something to think about because a lot of that is determined by biological factors. You know, so a huge chunk of the reason that you're here is because you know, you won part of the genetic lottery, so like, hooray for you. And no one screwed it up too badly as you were growing up. You know, but even among you guys, the correlation between your intelligence and your, and your grade point average is quite high, even though it's a truncated sample, right, because you're all pretty bright. And even though there's a lot of error in the grade measurement system, because it, it doesn't only index intelligence, it's still very powerful. And so 
the one, the peop, if, you, if you controlled for conscientiousness and other elements of personality, which you can do statistically, in 20 years, the 10% the of the people in this room who have the highest IQs will have the highest income virtually certainly, you know, unless some terrible thing happens to them. You can overcome it to some degree if you're really hardworking, and that's conscientiousness, you know, and that, but that's also a trait which seems to have quite a heavy biological loading. So, well, so that's the sort of thing that people hate about psychometricians because they come up with these facts and they're facts that are really dismal. And I, I can give you an example. So, so you guys all have an IQ of over 150, roughly speaking. 100 makes you about as smart as the typical high school graduate. You know, 115, that's kind of the low end for, for managing the rigors of a, a fairly high-end university. You know, 115, you're still going to have a lot of trouble. You're going to have to work like mad. So, but, okay, so 150. Now, that's one standard deviation above the mean. One standard deviation below the mean is an IQ of 85. Now, there's just as many people out there in the world who have an IQ of 85 as there are people who are able to go to college. Okay, so then you think, what can you do if you have an IQ of 85? Well, here's one answer. So the U.S. Army has been doing psychometric testing for a hundred and some years um, for a whole bunch of reasons, but they've done a lot of the basic science, you know. And uh, one thing about the U.S. Army is they like to have recruits. And you can understand why, because do you really want to go off somewhere and get shot? And the answer to that is generally no. So it's not like there are people lining up to get into the Army. Even in peacetime, it's hard to get people. And also, the Americans have used the U.S. Army as a, you know, imagine you have a, an underclass of people who aren't doing very well, which is the case in every society, and you want to boost some of them up, you know, into something resembling the middle class, you can do that fairly effectively by inducting the young men in particular into the army, because they get some training and, you know, they get some discipline and maybe they can kind of clamber up into the middle class. And so there's a lot of policy reasons, A, why the American army, armed forces, want people, and B, you know, just to be in the army, but also for social reasons, positive social reasons. So they're not likely not to let you in. The, the consequence of 100 years of IQ testing was the, was the uh, establishment of a law in the United States. You cannot induct anyone into the army, you cannot accept them into the army if they have an IQ of less than 82. That's 10% of the population. So you think about that. That means one person in 10 cannot do anything that is of positive value in an organization that's rather complex, but not more complex than other organizations, that's desperate for people. Nothing they can offer has positive value. It's worse to have them in the army than not to have them there at all. Really? Now, you know, that, that's a terrible way of putting it, but it's, it's a horrible, it's a horrible statistic. Because it also means, you know, if you think about the army as roughly equivalent to the world in some sense, in terms of its complexity, it means that there's 10% of the population who just cannot really exist well in a complex cognitive society. 